Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic acts recommended and discouraged during the fasting. Dr. Zakia, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum As Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, Allah Barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Masha, Alhamdulillah. This topic, again, such an important one. In fact, every 32 we will do, inshallah, will be very, very important. Inshallah. Could you, Dr. Zakia, to start the proceedings, simply tell our viewers what are the recommended acts during Ramadan? Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. Awuzu billahi min ash-shaytanin rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shali sadri wa yisalli amri. Wahlul ugdata min lisani yafqaw kawli. Normally, all the acts that are recommended during the normal days are also recommended during the month of Ramadan, except those acts which break the fast. But there are specific acts which have been recommended by a prophet, especially during the month of Ramadan, and some acts are encouraged more during the month of Ramadan. And there are many of them. Uh, I'll try and list as many as I can. The first is having suhoor. We should not neglect that suhoor. Number two is having suhoor as late as possible, just before the break of dawn. Third is having an early iftar, as early as possible, just after sunset. The fourth is having dates and water when you break the fast. Fifth is saying the recommended du'as after you break the fast. And the sixth is that when you break the fast, it is preferable you invite other people, especially the poor people. And these six, inshallah, we'll be discussing tomorrow. The other thing which I recommend with the Prophet is, number one, that we should do as many good deeds as possible during the month of Ramadan. Number two, we should be more generous in the month of Ramadan. Number three, that if someone tries to provoke you, you should not get angry, but you should say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Number four, we should use the sevak, that the tooth stick. Number five, that if possible, you should perform Umrah during the month of Ramadan. Number six, should try and acquire as much knowledge as possible. Read the Quran along with the translation. We have to read the Hadith, read other Islamic books. Number seven, we have to attend as many Islamic programs as possible, lectures, seminars, to increase our Islamic knowledge. Number eight, we should watch Islamic programs, maybe on the video, watch Islamic cassettes, your Islamic audio tapes of scholars so that we increase in our knowledge. Number nine, we have to be happy throughout the day. We should not look gloomy. Number 10, we should husni suluk with other people. Number 11, we should be extra good to our family. Number 12, we should do tafakkur. That means ponder and think on it. And number 13 is that we should see to it that we try and forgive people's faults. And there are other acts which the Prophet also recommended, which inshallah we'll be dealing in detail in the other days. For example, the Prophet said that we should specially be careful that all our compulsory salah we should offer in congregation as far as possible in the mosque. Number two is we should offer as much as sunnah salah, as much as nawafil. Number three, we should supplicate as much as possible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, we should ask for forgiveness because this is the month of forgiveness. Number five, we should recite as much Quran as possible. Number six, we should offer tarawih. Number seven, we should, especially in the last 10 days, we should do Qiyamul Layl. Number eight is we should do Ihtikaf in the last 10 days if possible. And number nine, we should give Zakat if we have not given. Number 10, is that we should do our own self-improvement as much as possible. Number 11, 
seeking Laylatul Qadr, number 12 is Isra of the other Muslim brothers, and number 13 is Dawah to the non-Muslims. So these, in short, are the three topics which I have listed, which are specially recommended in the month of Ramadan. Subhanallah. A lot of topics that we've got to get through, Dr. Zak here. And I hope and I trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can get as much benefit out to the viewers and to ourselves first Inshallah. and foremost as, as well. Inshallah. And first six topics we discussed tomorrow under the heading Suhoor and Iftar. Inshallah. So that will be very interesting. Then we've got the last 13 topics that you've enunciated. Of course they will be discussed in the coming days from the 9th until the 20th of Ramadan. And the middle topics that you've discussed, we will now take them on as importance right now. So Dr. Zakir, the first topic we need to discuss today is how can one understand generosity in terms of Ramadan? What are the acts of generosity that you would recommend a Muslim to be involved in? A person should always be generous for his life, but during Ramadan, he should be more generous, it should reach its peak. And there are various ways a person can be generous. For example, one thing which normally people think about generosity is helping people with money. But that is not the only act of generosity. That is one of the acts of generosity, helping someone with your money. Mm -hmm. The other act of generosity is that if you share your knowledge, if you guide someone to Islam someone or to Dawah to the non-Muslims, even this is generosity, you help him with your knowledge. The other act of generosity is maybe you may help them with your physical strength in doing some work or maybe lifting something. Even that's the act of generosity. Any good deed is an act of generosity. For example, you may be in a position. Being in that position, the job you're doing, you may be able to help someone in fulfilling his need. Even that's an act of generosity. So all these come under the acts of generosity. And the hadith of a prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Revelation, hadith number five. It is said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the most generous of all the people. And during the month of Ramadan, his generosity used to reach the peak. And Archangel Gabriel used to visit him during the month of Ramadan and used to rehearse the Quran. And it is said that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was more generous than the strong, uncontrollable wind. He was the peak of generosity. Further, beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's my hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 3233, where it is said, that there will be rooms in paradise where you can see inside the room from the outside and you can see the outside from inside. And these rooms will be prepared for those people who are generous and who help the poor people, those who fast regularly and those who pray at night. So these are special rooms prepared for those people in paradise. Further, there's a hadith, Sayyadi, mentioned in Ibn Majah, hadith number 1746, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that any person who feeds the person who has fasted, he will get the reward of the person who he has fed, who has been fasting, without diminishing the reward of the person who was fasting. Therefore, it shows that we should encourage people, to feed other people. All these are acts of generosity. SubhanAllah. I hope and pray that we can be as generous as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this month. Inshallah. So Dr. Zakir, the month of forgiveness, Ramadan, is upon us and Allah has recommended us to be forgiving of one another during this month. Can you explain more about that? This is the month of forgiveness and since we ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has also recommended that we human beings, we should forgive others. And there are several verses in the Quran which have explained this in detail. If you read Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 134, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you should forgive. Allah likes those who do good deeds. That means those who forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes them. Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 199, that hold to forgiveness and enjoin what is right and go away from those who are ignorant. Furthermore, Allah says in Surah Nur, Chapter number 24, verse number 22, Allah says that, and you should forgive. Wouldn't you want that Allah should forgive you? Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. Allah says in Surah Taqabun, 
chapter number 64, verse number 14, that amongst your wives and children, there are some who are your enemies. But it will be better if you forgive them. You overlook their fault and you cover up their fault. Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging the Muslims and the believers that it is better that you forgive as many people as possible. And Allah will forgive you. And we have the best examples in the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the example in the life of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Where we know, Prophet Yusuf peace be upon him, that his stepbrothers, they had planned against him and they wanted to kill him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves him. And later on, he is made the governor of Egypt. And when finally all the brothers are at his mercy, Allah says that he said, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 92. He says that, let not reproach the cast on you. And Allah is the one to forgive. He's merciful. That means Yusuf alayhi salam, he forgives all his brothers. And he says Allah is merciful. We have the best example of forgiveness in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa During Fatih Mecca, when the mushriks, when the pagans of Mecca, they killed many of the relatives, that killed his uncle, that killed many of the sahabas. But when finally he had victory over them, he forgave all of them. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that verily in the Prophet you have the most beautiful pattern of conduct. And Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 34, Allah says that repel evil with good. And you may never know, the person in whose heart is hated against you, you will find that he will become an intimate friend of yours. That means repel evil with what is good. That is the best. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 37. He speaks about those people, that means the people of paradise. Those are the people who avoid shameful deeds and avoid major sins. And when they get angry, they forgive. So there are various verses in the Quran which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us guidance to the human beings that we should forgive the other people. Well, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakia, for that reminder regarding forgiving our dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Inshallah, we'll see you soon after this short break. It is dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are discussing the topic, acts recommended and discouraged whilst fasting. Next question relates to anger. Dr. Zakir, regarding anger management in the month of Ramadan, people are fasting during the month of Ramadan, they're getting angry. Is there any excuse for a person getting angry in the month of Ramadan. Is it a valid excuse indeed for them to say, we are fasting, we're entitled to get angry? In fact, it is opposite. That a person, while fasting, he should not get angry. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. It says, la lakum tattakoon so that you may learn self-control. So in fact, if you're fasting, all the more reason you should not get angry. It is the opposite. It can't be a valid excuse that because I'm hungry, because I'm tired, I can get angry. It is the opposite. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, let's mention the Sahih Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1904. A beloved Prophet said that fasting is a shield. And you should not speak obscenely. You should not yell at anyone else. And if someone abuses you, or someone tries to provoke you, or someone tries to make you angry, you should say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. And the same message is repeated also in Sai Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1894. My beloved prophet said that someone provokes you or makes you angry, say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. It further repeated even in Sai Muslim, several places. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Manners, Hadith number 6114, our beloved Prophet said that the strong person is not one 
who defeats another person with his strength. The stronger person is not one who overcomes another with his strength, but the stronger person is one who, when someone makes him angry, he forgives him. He does not get angry. So, actually, fasting shows us a way how to control ourselves. And as you rightly said, it's somewhat like management on how to control your anger. SubhanAllah. Well, if we can control our anger whilst we're fasting, we can do it anytime, inshallah. inshallah. Dr. Zakir, regarding something which is very beloved, that is doing, performing the Umrah during the month of Ramadan, any particular advice regarding that action during Ramadan? As far as the advantage of doing Umrah in the month of Ramadan, our Prophet encouraged it. I told the Sabas, he encouraged the Sabas that you should do Umrah during the month of Ramadan. And a Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, word number three, in the book of Umrah, Hadith number 172, the Prophet said that anyone who does Umrah in the month of Ramadan, it is equivalent to Hajj. That means if you perform Umrah in the month of Ramadan, any day of Ramadan, whether starting, middle or end, it is equivalent to performing Hajj. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, it's a very good reason, of course, to do Umrah during this blessed month. Dr. Zakir, many people have the misconception that using the siwak during the fast in Ramadan is discouraged. Could you just clarify this point, please? There are many people who think that using siwak while you're fasting is discouraged. It is based on the hadith. The same hadith I quoted earlier of Sahih Bukhari, volume 3, in the book of fasting. Hadith number 1904 and 1894. Prophet Muhammad said that by Allah, in whose hand is my soul. The breath of a person who fasts is sweeter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the scent of musk. Now based on this people think that if you use sewaq, the breath, the bad breath that normally comes in a person who fasts will not be there. So Allah will not enjoy the breath. And based on this, they think it is discouraged. In fact, we should realize that when a person is using the sewaq, to stick, it does not stop the bad breath which normally comes when a person fasts. Because when you use the tooth stick, the sewaq, it normally massages the gums. And if there are any food particles in between the teeth, like how you use a toothbrush, it is somewhat similar to that. The bad breath of fasting comes from the stomach, because no food enters the stomach. And that's how it comes. So no way does it contradict that. And furthermore, beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 887 that the beloved Prophet said that if it wasn't too difficult for my ummah, I would have made it compulsory to use the sewaq before every prayer. How wudu is compulsory? So the Prophet said, if it wouldn't have been difficult for the ummah, it would have made it compulsory to use the sewaq every time before prayer. And that means it is a recommended act. And if it wasn't good for fasting, he would have mentioned it. Like how we mentioned for excessive sniffing of water, hadith of Abu Dawud, Point number two, hadith number 2360, where our beloved Prophet said that sniff water excessively through your nose while doing ablution, except while fasting. That means sniffing water excessively is good, but don't do it while fasting because there are dangers that will go into the throat and enter the stomach. So here too, if it was a disadvantage, the Prophet has said that I would have told my ummah to use the sevak except while fasting. So based on this, using sevak in the sunnah, it is a recommended act, it is mustahab, and you should do it, and inshallah it will get your rewards. Dr. Zakir, how can a person seek knowledge during the blessed month of Ramadan? Seeking knowledge is a very good act, especially in the month of Ramadan. There are various ways a person can seek knowledge, besides saying the Quran, which is a recommended thing during Ramadan. A person should even read the translation of the Quran. He should read the book of Hadith. And as far as possible, he should read the books which are sahih, the books of authentic hadith. The best is the Qutb al-Sitta. If you can read that, there's nothing like it. That is Bukhari, Muslim, Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Nisai, Ibn Majah. These Qutb al-Sitta are the best. If time doesn't permit, at least he should read the sahih books of hadith, that is the sahih Bukhari and sahih Muslim. If time doesn't permit, at least he should read the summarized version of Sahih Muslim, or the summarized version of Sahih Bukhari, or at least read the Muttafiq alaik. 
the hadith was a comment between Bukhari and Muslim. He can read the book of the Seerah of the Prophet. And the best book on the Seerah of the Prophet in English language is Raik al Maktoum, the seal nectar. He speaks about the biography of the Prophet. The other book on the Seerah of the Prophet is the book of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Taya al Ismail. Even that's a good book. A person can acquire knowledge by attending programs. He can go to an Islamic organization, attend lectures, attend seminars. This will increase his knowledge. He can watch video cassettes of Islamic lectures, of Islamic programs. He can hear audio cassettes. He can go on the internet, go to Islamic websites, go to authentic Islamic websites. So these are ways in which a person can acquire knowledge. And this is a good way of spending your time during the month of Ramadan, acquiring knowledge, and surely you will be benefited and you'll get a great deal of reward. Inshallah. Inshallah. All of those books, of course, you've mentioned are available in various languages around the world. So there's not really much excuse for somebody not to pick them up during the blessed month of Ramadan. So Dr. Zakir, what does the term Husna Suluk mean? And what does it mean to be good to your family? During the month of Ramadan, Normally people have another excuse that because they're fasting, they seem to be tired, they seem to be as though they have been drawn. Prophet advised that you should look cheerful and happy. You should not look to be sad. You should be cheerful and happy. And we should especially be good to your family. And you should give more time to your family so that they get reward along with you. As far as doing Husni Suluk with the other people, this is the month where, besides the normal months, in this month you should be extra good to the people, to your neighbors, to your friends, also to your relatives, do good deeds, forgive their faults, be happy with them, be cheerful. And we should also do tafakkur, that we think and plan our day in Ramadan so that we get the maximum reward. May Allah make it easy for us to be very, very good and righteous and, and good of character and follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the best of character uh, during this blessed month of Ramadan, Dr. Zakir. Now we move on to the second part of uh, the show, which is to discuss the discouraged acts. Can you now briefly outline the discuss the discouraged acts during fasting during the month of Ramadan? The acts which are discouraged during fasting can be divided into three categories. The first is acts that are discouraged, which are contrary to the sunnah of fasting. Number two, acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan, which are otherwise also prohibited. Number three, the other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, we'll see you soon after the short break. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers. And today we are discussing the topic, acts recommended and discouraged whilst fasting. Dr. Zakir, could you just mention the acts which are discouraged, uh, which are contrary to the sunnah of fasting? The acts which are discouraged and contrary to the sunnah, besides the ones we said should be recommended, I won't repeat that. It's just the opposite. It is a person should not say the niyyah aloud while fasting. The niyyah should not be said aloud. Number two is a person should not eat excessively during iftar or in the night. Number three, a person should not get angry. Point number four is that people read the Taravi very fast. They rush through the Taravi. And point number five is people socialize during Aitakaf. Which are the actions discouraged in Ramadan which are also prohibited otherwise? Could you say something about those actions? The actions which are normally prohibited, and specifically during Ramadan also it's prohibited, it is backbiting and slandering, number one, one of the major sins. Number two, is false speech and telling lies. Number three is verbal abuse and swearing. Number four is vulgar speech. Number five is rumor mongering and gossiping. Number six is false action. Number seven is listening 
to un Islamic songs and music. Number eight is watching un Islamic programs on the television and un Islamic movies. Number nine is reading un Islamic magazines and reading un Islamic books. Number 10 is going to un Islamic websites. Number 11 is wastage of food. And uh, number 12 is extravagance and being spendthrift. Dr. Zakir, how do we admonish a person who does not guard his tongue whilst fasting in the month of Ramadan? Guarding the tongue is very important because many a times or most of the times the tongue can cause more damage to a person than whether it be physical torture or whatever it is. You know, tongue. The person should be careful of the tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, and there are various say, hadith dealing with this topic. If you read the hadith of Musannaf ibn Abi Shaiba, volume number five, in the book of manners, hadith number 26490, Ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that by Allah, there is nothing more deserving than the extended control of the tongue. And a similar message is given in the next hadith of Musannaf ibn Abi Shaiba, volume number five, in the book of manners, hadith number 26491, where Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, holding his tongue, that this is the thing that has got me to this position. That means he was careful of his tongue. That is the reason he reached this position. And there are many verses in the Quran where Allah says in Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 18, that not a word that you say which is not written by a sentinel without noting it down. That means every word that you say is being written down by an angel. Further, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 53. Allah says that say to the believers that they should say things which are best. And Satan, many a time, he sows discord amongst the people, amongst the human beings. And Satan to you is an avowed enemy. So Allah says and guides us in the Quran that we be careful when you use your tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, this hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, poem number 8, hadith number 6484, where a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that a Muslim to another Muslim, he should not harm him by his tongue or his hands. That a Muslim is a person who does not harm the other Muslim by his hand or by his tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad further said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Volume number eight, hadith number 6474, where our beloved Prophet said that anyone who can guarantee the safety, that is the chastity, of what is between the two jawbones, talking about the tongue, and what is between the two legs, talking about the private part, he will be guaranteed paradise. He's a person who can guarantee the chastity, the safety of the tongue and the private part, he will be guaranteed paradise. My beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, further said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6475, that he said that he who believes in Allah and the last day, he should either speak what is good or he should keep quiet. That means when you open your tongue, speak what is good, otherwise keep quiet. And a prophet also said, as I mentioned in several hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, book of fasting, hadith number 1894, hadith number 1904, that fasting is a shield. So fasting helps you to protect and helps you in self-control and a person should guard his tongue that is the best for him. Indeed, Dr. Zaki, it seems like these are lessons that we need to take on board all of the time, not just in Ramadan. The next important topic regards a person who commits fasthood. I want to know the, what is the ruling regarding a person who commits fasthood of the tongue whilst fasting in Ramadan? A person who says false things or lies during the month of Ramadan, as the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1903, that a person who does not leave his false actions and false speech, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require him to leave his food and drink. That means a person who keeps on lying and continues doing his false action and false tongue, Allah does not require him to leave his food or drink. 
indicating that that doesn't mean that the fast will break. If you fast, this is not one of the things that break the fast, but the reward that you get for fasting, it will be diminished. And if you do a sin, such as telling a lie, but natural, what reward you want to get while fasting, it will be diminished, or maybe it will nullify. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Majah, volume number three book of fasting, hadith number 1690, that there are many people who fast but do not get any reward. It is as though they are fasting only for hunger. That means if you do such acts of false deeds or false action, your reward is not there, as though you are just keeping yourself hungry or starving or dieting. The main purpose that you learn self-restraint is defeated. May Allah encourage us and help us to perform righteous actions which we benefit from in this world and the hereafter. Inshallah. Next question. What are the dangers of backbiting and gossip mongering during the month of Ramadan? One of the major sins in Islam it is slandering and backbiting. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Humza, chapter number 104, verse number one, Wailulli kulli humazatil lumaza. Vote to every kind of backbiter and slanderer. That you have to vote to everyone who backbites and slanders. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 12, that avoid suspicion. Because sometimes suspicion is a sin. Do not speak ill about anyone behind the back. Are you ready to eat the meat of your dead brother? And Allah continues and saying that, nay, you would abhor it. Here Allah gives the example that a person who backbites, it is as though he is eating his own brother. Now eating the meat of your own brother is haram. And further it says, eating dead meat. Eating dead meat is also haram. So if you backbite, you are committing a double sin. Not only eating the meat of your brother, eating the flesh of your dead brother. So it is a very grave sin. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number six to six five, where Prophet Muhammad asked the sahabas that do you know what is backbiting? They say that the messenger of Allah knows the best. So Prophet Muhammad says that if a person speaks about somebody else behind his back, which he would not have liked, that is called as backbiting. Speaking about somebody behind his back, which the person would not like is called as backbiting. So one of the Saba, he asked that, O Prophet, what if the thing I have spoken is the truth or the fault which I mentioned does exist in the person? So the Prophet said that if what you have spoken is the truth and the fault does exist, it is called as backbiting, otherwise it's called as slandering. So backbiting is a grave sin. There's another Sahih Hadith mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, Ram number three, in the Book of Manners, Hadith number 4857. Where Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet, she speaks about Safiya and says that she is such a such thing, meaning she is short statured. The Prophet immediately says that what you have said, if your words were mixed in the sea, it would spoil the full sea. Further, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number three, in the book of Manners, Hadith number 4860, where it's mentioned, Anas, may Allah be pleased with him. He says that Prophet Muhammad said, when he was taken up to heaven, that he saw some people whose nails were made of copper and they were scratching their faces and their breast. And when he asked that, who are these people? So the reply was, these are the people who backbited. Indicating that backbiting is a grave sin. And it is one of the major sins which people should abstain from. And many of us, they do it unknowingly not realizing that it's a grave sin, we should abstain from it. And the Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, in the Book of Manners, Hadith number 6056, a rumor monger, he shall not enter paradise. So these hadiths we come to know that we have to be careful, we should guard our tongue, especially from backbiting and gossip mongering. May Allah indeed guard our tongue against falling into these errors. Inshallah, we'll see you soon after the short break. It is Ramadan. 
Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are discussing the topic acts recommended and discouraged whilst fasting. Dr. Zakir, regarding other issues or other acts which are discouraged, which we haven't already covered, can we now mention other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan? The other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan is that many people, they sleep the full day because they're awake in the night and they only get up for the salah and they go back. They convert the day into night, night into day, which is not the purpose of fasting. Number two, many people, they are lazy and inactive during the day. Number three, many people kill their time during the daytime with things like play, game, amusement, rather than doing things which are encouraged and sunnah of the Prophet. Number four, many of them, they give iftar party rather to show off than to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, many people, they ask the women folk in the house to cook a variety of dishes for suhoor and for iftar, thus making most of the women spend major portion of the time in the month of Ramadan in the kitchen, rather than spending time in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sixth mistake that people make is that they spend a lot of time in renovation of the house in the month of Ramadan, trying to prepare for it rather than worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh thing that discouraged is many people stay awake the full night and indulge in activities which are unproductive rather than worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number eight is that many people they spend time in excessive socializing after Tarawih, after Qiyam al -Layl. Number nine is many people spend time in shopping. They spend most part of the night in shopping. Number 10 is that they spend excessive time in eating the full night. Number 11 is many of them they spend the night loitering and roaming about rather than 